<clears throat> I mean, forgive me for interrupting. I know, I did two minutes ago. <clears throat> All right, good. Good evening, y'all. And it's uh, good to have you here this evening. And uh, we're going to get into the Word here in just a few moments. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize. Uh, I know that Brother Willis came uh, last Wednesday, and anybody else who came, I'm sorry? He had church by himself. He was out there dancing in the foyer and all that kind of stuff, and I'm not sure if we believe that. But, uh, no, but I do apologize that I didn't get everybody uh, contacted. Um, I've got a text message thread that I'm going to be adding everybody to I'm just going to add everybody to you if, if I got your phone number I'm going to put your name in there so you get the text message but there's also some that only get phone calls and I didn't have my phone tree with me and I'm going to be dividing that up and giving it to my board anyway because I don't have time to do it all the time so uh but I do apologize for the late notice about uh, canceling service last Wednesday however I have been giving you notice that next Wednesday will be canceled. So uh, we're not having service next Wednesday because of just people getting ready for Thanksgiving. Some people have their dinners on Wednesdays and all that sort of thing. So uh, we're going to have tonight, then we'll have a break, and then we'll get into it again uh, the following Wednesday the 30th. So keep that in mind if you would. I want to make sure everybody knows tomorrow night at 6 p.m. over at the Life Center, we are having our Thanksgiving dinner I keep saying Christmas. I'm ready, brother. I'm ready to get something. I'm ready for my wife to buy me many gifts. And, uh, and uh, she always does such a wonderful job helping Santa. So, uh, but our Thanksgiving dinner is going to be tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. And so we're going to have a great time of fellowship as we get together for that. And then uh, church, as usual, uh, on Sunday at uh, Sunday school at 10, morning worship at 11. Make sure that you come out for that. And I hope that everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving. If anybody is traveling, I'll be surprised because y'all are all from here. It's like all your families are all from here. Where are you going to travel to? You don't know anybody anywhere else. So uh, congratulations for that because traveling at Thanksgiving is, is quite a pain. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, I had kind of mentioned it a little bit, and I know we're getting a few weeks ahead here, but we are having service on Christmas morning. It's going to be an abbreviated service. We're going to have it at 10 o'clock, and uh, it'll last maybe about 30 minutes, if that. Obviously, if you're not able to come out because, well, we're doing family stuff and whatever, we understand. But if it's just me and my family, then so be it. We'll be here on Christmas morning, but we're going to be... Uh, uh, we're going to be here, and we are going to have service at 10 o'clock. I figured we'd do it at that time because people are used to coming for Sunday school anyway. So uh, just sort of keep that in mind and be thinking about that as you're getting all your plans and what have you together. Uh, as our usher is coming, I want us to remember a few needs. If we could, please, uh, first of all, of course, we need to continue to remember Lisa. Uh, she is. She was supposed to have surgery tomorrow uh, however, because of scheduling, they've uh, changed that to Friday. So she is going to be having at least triple bypass on Friday. So please keep her and the family in your prayers. The great thing is that the doctors have said that as far as her health for the surgery, that she's in good shape. And so uh, they, in fact, I was in there when the surgeon had come in and they said, you have about a 98% chance that everything is going to be absolutely great. So we thank God for that, and that's what we're believing for. So just keep Lisa and the family in your prayers. I know it's been a very stressful week for them, just sitting there and having to wait and wait and wait and wait. So uh, remember them, of course, continue to remember Todd Crawford. I just heard this afternoon or this evening before service, he has been moved to a rehab facility. Uh, I think, what would you say, Vibra? Is that what you said? And we don't know if it's Vibra or Vibra, and we don't even care. We're going to say however Ms. Diane says it. So Vibra. Vibra, Las Vegas. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but anyway, she, <laughs> she had told me that uh, he's been moved to a, a rehab. That's great news when you consider the fact a couple weeks ago they were saying you might as well pull the plug. 
but God has been showing up, but just continue to remember, Todd, in your prayers, if you would. We have a lot of other people that have been struggling with sickness and, and, and problems, but we know that God is great, and we know that he is able. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray as we pray over the offering and pray over these needs today. Father, we come to you thanking you for the beautiful day that you've given us today. Lord, every day that we have that we can worship you, every day that we have where we can wake up knowing that we are a child of the King. Lord, it's a wonderful day, and we thank you for it. And Lord, we pray that you will just uh, let your presence be in this place today. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom as we get into the word today. I pray, Father, that you will meet every need that is represented in this house, the ones that we have been talking about, uh, those that maybe have not been mentioned. But Lord, you know every need and you know that you have a plan for those needs and that you're going to make a way where there seems to be no way. And Lord, in this world of chaos and trouble and heartache, God, we're so thankful that you're the standard. We're so thankful, God, that you're the rock that we can build upon. And we just pray that you will build us, that you will build us up to be who you desire us to be. Help us to give abundantly. Help us to give sacrificially. Help us to give scripturally so that everything that we have, all of our finances, Lord, that they can be blessed by you because our treasure is not in worldly things, but it's in you, Lord. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give today. And we're going to get into the Word, and I'm going to wrap up. I was going to wrap it up last week, but uh, with the, the funeral uh, for Trey, uh, we'll be wrapping it up tonight. But we're going to wrap up the view from above, talking about a couple more things that we as Christians are going to be experiencing, and some things that we need to make sure that we know the difference between one or the other, that sort of thing. So the, the very first thing I want to talk about is uh, there are two judgment seats. Well, in fact, you know what? Let me back up just a moment. I, let me check this first. Does anybody have a question that has been on their mind that you've been waiting for two weeks because we didn't have service last week? You've been waiting for two weeks to be able to ask this question concerning anything that we've discussed about any of the end times uh, situation, anything that we're going to be going through or that the sinner's going to be going through or anything that maybe you, you have some confusion about. All right, well, then we'll get to what I was going to talk about. Uh, as I said, uh, there's two judgment seats that uh, you'll hear people talk about, and some people will actually use them interchangeably, and they're not. There are, they're two separate events. One of them is the judgment seat of Christ, and we see actually where Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, Rochelle, are you able to pull that up? I'll give you just a moment. Uh, it's almost like having to flip through the pages, because uh, I didn't give her any scriptures today, bless her heart. Uh, I'm sorry about that, uh, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 9, Paul is talking a little bit about the judgment seat of Christ as he's speaking to the church in Corinth in his second letter. And uh, may you be blessed as you sneeze. Hallelujah. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. See, look how good she is. Uh, verse 9. Paul is writing, he says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Then we go to verse 10. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. This is one of the places where Paul mentions about the judgment seat of Christ. When you look at the word judgment seat, and you, you try to figure out exactly what it's saying, the, the Greek word there is bema. And what Bema means is, it, it means a judgment seat, but what a Bema was is it was a, a, almost like a throne that was elevated, but it was used to give awards and to give accolades. So the kind of judge uh, that might be on that, that seat, that Bema, just in regular, you know, obviously we're, we know who Jesus is, but just talking about in the regular world, uh, the type of, of judge that would be there would be one that maybe had judged a contest. You know, we have, uh, you know, churches will have chili cook-offs or, you know, they'll, they'll do, um, you know, the trick-or-treat thing or one thing that our family does that I'm really getting sick of because I'd never win is 
uh, around Easter and Christmas, we'll do like cookie decorating or pumpkin decorating contests. And then Crystal takes these pictures, and somehow she lets everybody know, probably by private messaging, which one's mine so that nobody will vote for it, even though it's clearly the best decorated cookie that anyone has ever seen. We did this at Easter, and I'm telling you, my cookie, I, I could see it on the cover of Good Housekeeping magazine, and yet... Somebody else got more votes than me. And like Alan will just kind of take stuff and go, and everybody's going, oh, it's so cute. I love that cookie. And you're a liar. You know mine was decorated better. But anyway, I digress because I'm getting into something that, you know, maybe I need to just talk about in, in therapy. But really what I'm, I mean to say, though, is that there, you know, different contests where there will be people that will judge and will say, you know, you had the best this, you did the best that, and whatever it may be. The Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, is not for the sinner. It is only for the saint. It is only for the one who has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And whether they... they uh, appeared before him uh, because they died and then they rose in the rapture or if they were raptured saints or if it's going to be a time uh, where they're going to appear before him because they were uh, uh, because they died during the tribulation after they became saved or they were witnesses to him in the uh, tribulation after they became saved the judgment seat of Christ is only for the Christian because God is going to show us and talk to us and Jesus Christ is going to let us know what we did on this earth that brought him glory now Paul also talks about in for uh, second Corinthians that whether it be good or bad now I don't think it's going to be a case of where Jesus is going to say you know why Vaughn, you did a great job you know and you cooked for people and you were nice to people but you know you also had this mean streak when it came to your pastor and so you were going to get this crown but I think we're just going to go ahead and put that aside instead so shame on you I don't think it's going to be like that although no I'm, I'm kidding I love you okay just checking making sure because she was giving me a death glare I was like see Jesus that's what I'm talking about right there I don't think it's going to be that so much as I believe that there, there may be some situations where the Lord says, you know, you did great doing these things, but just to bring to your remembrance, there was this time when somebody came to you and I gave you a golden opportunity to tell them about me and you didn't do it because of your fear or you didn't do it because of whatever it may be. I believe that we're going to feel very thrilled about some of the things that we did that seemed so small and yet they had a huge impact. But I also believe that we're going to be saying, Lord, I wish I would have done more. I wish I would have done more. But then he's going to say, but it's okay. It's okay because you still you served me. And you, were, you still used your gifts and you still used your talents. Um, I will, one of these days, I'm going to do a, a lesson about the crowns in the Bible, the crowns that we're supposed to be receiving. And everybody thinks of crowns and they think of a big golden crown. But you've got to remember that the kind of crowns that we were talking about back then were probably just laurels. They were like the little wreaths that they would uh, put on the athletes that won the, the race or, or that uh, had done the, the best job you know, doing whatever the, the contest was. So we're not necessarily talking about golden crowns, and, but in, in some situations they may be. But more than likely we're looking at laurels. We're looking at just something, an, an accolade to just recognize the work that you've done and recognize your accomplishments. The judgment seat of Christ is going to be taking place pretty much immediately after the rapture. All right. When the rapture takes place, and I know you might say, but that's billions of people that Christ is going to have to judge. Well, the thing is, he's omnipresent. So I have no question in my mind that there's probably going to be a, a situation where it's like I may be standing before the throne, and you might think that you're standing before the throne. I believe it's going to be a very personal thing. I believe that, that uh, Christ is going to speak to us individually but at the same time it may be all happening all at the same time you know we, we've got to remember to get our minds out of the boxes that we have built and understand we're talking about the supernatural we're talking about God and the way that he's going to do things but the judgment seat of Christ is going to take place right after the rapture and like I said that's where the Lord is going to say you know 
in your preaching, you know, this many people were saved. And, or, you know, you gave to missions and this many people received me as their Savior because of that. Or you saved someone's life and saved their, their heart as well because you were there for them at this time. And you didn't even realize they were about to kill themselves. But you gave, spoke a word of encouragement to them and you helped them to keep going on and they eventually found me. That's the kind of thing that's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the other judgment seat that we hear about is the great white throne judgment. How many of you have heard that term before? Great white throne judgment. Okay. The great white throne judgment is only for the sinner. All right? The, the judgment seat of Christ is only for the saint. The great white throne judgment is only for the sinner. One of the terms that we use for Jesus is that he is a righteous judge. He is righteous. He is not just saying, this is the way it is. I don't care what you think about it. La, 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 la. That's all that, that there is to it. He is actually going to have, God, God the Father is going to have every person that has ever died in their sin or denied him or whatever it may be, every person that has not received Christ is going to stand before God. And God is going to give them an opportunity to plead their case. Well, I, I wasn't raised in church. Um, well, I, I was raised in a country where we were mostly Muslim, and, and so that's the, the religion I followed. Or, or, well, you know, I mean, I studied things in science, and I just didn't believe that you existed. And, and I, I thought, well, you know, surely it's got to be this or it's got to be that. All these different excuses that are going to be coming up. And I believe that every time that somebody says, well, I, I never knew. I never knew about you. I believe that God is going to bring to their remembrance a time when he tried to bring somebody into their life to tell them about Christ, and they laughed in their face. They denied who he was. I believe that even, you know, because here, here's my belief. Here's in my humble opinion, as they say. Here is my belief. The reason why Adam and Eve had to leave the garden was not because of the fact that they had sinned, it was because of the fact, because this is what Scripture says, that they had eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life was in the garden. They now had the knowledge of being able to tell right from wrong. They now came to that place of accountability because they ate of that tree. And so what God said was, I don't want you to be in this garden and eat of this tree of life, and yet here you are, you're steeped in sin because now you know the difference between right and wrong, and you have done what is wrong, and now you've got sin. I don't want you to live eternally in your sin, okay? So we know, and we, we use the whole term, the age of accountability, you know, and I'm, I'm going to try not to go down. That's a, a deep rabbit hole I could go down, but I'm going to try not to do that tonight. Um, we use the term of age of accountability and all that kind of thing. I believe it's different for every person because it, it's about understanding. It's about having more than just knowledge, but having understanding. We can tell our children that Jesus died on the cross for them when they're two years old. And they'll say, okay, and then they'll go about and play with their Barbies or whatever it is. But when they come to that place of understanding, when they realize why he had to die on the cross, when they realize what happened because he died on the cross, and then they receive Christ as their Savior, they're now accountable. Okay? So, all that being said, if you've got somebody who they live in a Muslim country, they're raised uh, in, in the Muslim religion, they don't know any other religion other than Islam, other than the, the Muslim religion, that's all that they know. They never hear the name Jesus Christ. They never know that Jesus died on the cross. They never know that he has come to save them. Can they be held accountable for not receiving him? If they never had the opportunity can they be held accountable? Boy, I'm getting like way into something that could be a huge discussion here. Let me back up just a little bit and get back to what we're talking about. I want you to take that nugget, put it right there in your pocket, and go home and pray about it and think about it for a little bit, okay? Because we're going to get back to this before I go way down that rabbit hole and we end up in like Detroit. So here's the thing. In the judgment seat of Christ, 
Everyone is going to stand before God, and they're going to give their excuses. And God is going to reveal to them times that they had an opportunity to receive him, but they chose not to. He's also going to show them, I believe, that all these people that go around mocking God, that these people that will, uh, will make jokes about God and about Christ, these people that will... Uh, We'll call him all these names and we'll try to make him out that he's, you know, he wasn't really God. He was just a magician and all these kinds of mess. I believe that God is going to remind every single one of those times, going to remind those people of what they did. I saw something that I thought was a joke. I honestly, I thought it was a joke video. And then I realized, no, this product actually exists. And it may be a joke product, but it's, it's not funny. Um, you all know what a Ouija board is, right? I saw something yesterday, and I, I showed Crystal, because like I said, I thought it was a, one of these satire sites that had this video. They had a Holy Ghost board. And the Holy Ghost board was a way where you could talk directly to Jesus. It was a Ouija board, but they had put Jesus' face on it. And the little thing that they push around, the planchet or whatever it's called, was in the shape of a cross, and they said, this board is guaranteed that the only one that will answer you is Jesus. You don't have to worry about running from the demons when you're done with this board, but you can talk directly to our Lord and Savior. And I thought it was some kind of a really bad joke until I realized that this product exists on Amazon. You can actually buy this thing on Amazon. I'm sure it's meant to be a joke product, but I'll be honest with you, I don't see the joke. I don't think it's funny. Somebody is mocking God by taking something that is, is divination, which is an abomination unto God, and trying to say, oh, but now we're doing it with Jesus Christ. We hear comedians all the time making jokes about that Jesus was gay or that Jesus was, uh, like I said, a magician or that Jesus actually wasn't as powerful as people thought that he was, that his, his deeds were highly exaggerated. At the great white throne judgment, every one of these really bad attempts at humor, every one of these mockings, every one of these blasphemies, I believe will be remind that the people that will be standing there before God will be reminded of what they did. They will be reminded to the point to where there will not be any more excuses that they can give. And then that's when God will pass sentence. Here's the thing about the great white throne judgment. You don't want to be at the great white throne judgment because every judgment is going to end the same way with God saying, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. And then you being cast into the lake of fire. So there's obviously a huge difference between the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. Judgment seat of Christ, good. Go to that one. Book your appointment. You know, if you're not ready to go to that, we'll take care of that before you leave the sanctuary today. Great white throne judgment not a fan you do not want to be there that is not for you that is for those who have rejected Jesus Christ the great white throne judgment is actually going to happen we see uh see it talked about in Revelation chapter 20 um and and I'm going to get to this also uh or let me see actually Revelation 20 is uh, I'm sorry Revelation 20 is not the one that oh yeah there it is see I knew I was right uh Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 And Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. In other words, you're not going to escape it. You're not going to get away. You're not going to be able to say, Never mind, if you're going to throw me in hell, just throw me in hell. They all will have to stand before God. Now, here's the thing. The verse right before that is Satan being thrown into the lake of fire for all of eternity. This is the great white throne judgment is going to happen after the thousand year millennial reign and after the season where Satan is released. Uh, I'm going to go back to Revelation 20, and I do apologize for not getting these verses to you uh, before service. I'm sorry about that. But I'm going to go back to Revelation 20, verse 4. 
Uh, no, 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 no. Verse 1. We'll, we'll start at verse 1. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, we're going from the throne judgments right into the millennial period. At that point, the millennial reign will begin. When, when Jesus comes for the second coming, he actually sets foot on the earth, and he goes and establishes his throne. He will take the Antichrist and the false prophet and will actually cast them into the lake of fire alive. They won't be for long. But uh, the Bible says that they will be cast in alive. Uh, but they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. And then Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. Um, anybody remember that, that old song, Our Lord is coming back to earth again. Yes, our Lord is coming back to earth again. Satan will be bound a thousand years. We'll have no tempter then. After Jesus shall come back to earth again. See, some of those old songs have some good theology to them. Um, Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. That's why we call it the millennial reign, the thousand years of peace. Jesus will be on the throne. He's not ever going to abdicate the throne. He will be on the throne for a thousand years, but then at the end of the thousand years, that seal that was talked about is going to be broken, and the word says that he must be loosed for a little season. Now, how long is a little season? We have no idea. We know that Jesus has been saying, behold, I come quickly. I come suddenly, and he has yet to come. Uh, we don't know how long a little season is, but we do know what's going to happen uh, is that Satan is going to come out of the bottomless pit, and he is going to attempt to rally the troops and unfortunately according to scripture he's gonna he's going to do it he's going to attempt to rally the troops of the people that are on earth that were born during the millennial reign or were born right towards the end of the tribulation let me come back to revelation 20 real quick and read this and then um we're gonna uh, read uh, starting at verse 7 and we'll read uh through verse 9 Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to, to gather them together to battle, and the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Let me, let me explain this first, because the thing that we, we think about is, well, who's left for Satan to get? Because we got all the, all the people that had the mark of the beast, and you know, most of them are going to die uh, at the end of the tribulation, you know, when Jesus comes back in the battle of Armageddon. So, and then everybody else is going to be saved, but we can't not be saved, right? Let me put your mind at ease about something. Once we go in the rapture, or we go by the grave, whatever it is, once we're gone and that's it, and now we are with Christ, we will always be with Christ. We're not going to fall the way that Satan fell, the way that Lucifer fell, where he was an angel and then he's going to fall away and now he's the devil. That's not going to happen to us. It would make a great Hollywood script, but that's not the way it's going to work with us. You've got to remember, number one, Lucifer didn't have a soul. We have a soul that has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we have accepted him as our Savior, and therefore we belong to him, and we have been sealed by him. There will not be a possibility of during that thousand-year reign of us turning on God, okay? So 
If that's in your mind, get that out of your mind. That's not going to happen. So who is it that Satan's going to gather about? Who is it that Satan is going to, as the word says, as the sands of the sea, and they're going to come past the, or, or, you know, and comes to the city, the beloved city and, and the camp of the saints? Who is it that we're talking about? There's going to be a thousand years of people who did not die during the tribulation because a, a quarter of the population will still be around. It's going to be a thousand years of people having babies. Those babies still need to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. They still need to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because they're still part of the human chain. They're still part of the human... Uh, uh, I, I look at sin as almost like a blood poisoning is the way that I, I've described it before where you know, as long as you are born of humans, you are in the chain of of sin you you have that infection you have that that curse that is on you so even these children that are going to be born in year 423 of jesus's millennial reign they still need to receive jesus christ at the end of the thousand years there will be people on the earth that will not and i I can't even imagine it because I'm thinking he's sitting right there on the throne in Jerusalem. It's not like we're asking you, you know, like we are now, where we're wanting you to have faith that, you know, that the Lord is real and that he is here and that he is alive. It's not even that. You can go there and you can see him. You can high five him. I mean, he's right there. And yet there's still going to be people that are not going to receive him. And that is who Satan is going to target. He's going to target them. And say, don't you think he's been in power long enough? Don't you think, you know, don't you think that there's a better way to do this? Why is it that everybody's having to serve him? Why can't we just serve each other? Why, and, and what's going to happen, unfortunately, he's a deceiver. And what's going to happen, according to the word, according to verse 8 of chapter 20, is that he's going to gather them to get together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So in the millennial reign... At the end of the thousand years, the thousand years will have to come to an end. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan's going to release, be released for a little season. We have no idea how long that's going to be. But just as they think, here we go, we're going to... We're going to take Jerusalem. We're going to take, you know, we're going to take down this, uh, this monarchy. And instead, we're going to bring back humanism or whatever it may, excuse me, whatever it may be. God's going to be watching the whole thing. And he's going to say, enough is enough. And fire is going to come down from heaven. It's going to destroy them all. And then at that point, Satan will have to appear before God. And I've preached about this before. Satan will have to appear before God. And I believe that we're all going to be there to witness this. And he is going to have to get on his knees and admit with his lying tongue, the tongue that has been used for millennia to, dis to try to blaspheme God, that tongue that has been used for millennia to tell lies into the hearts and minds of men and women of Jesus Christ, that have been, it has been used to convince people that don't know Christ, that they're better off without him, that has taken the word of God and has twisted it so many different ways. For the first time in his existence he is going to speak something and it is going to be truth and he is going to say jesus christ is lord the word of god says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that jesus christ is lord satan is going to have to to confess that he's going to have to get on his knees he's going to have to bow his knee before jesus christ before the creator before the redeemer before the savior and he's going to have to say with that forked tongue jesus christ is lord once that takes place he will then be cast into the lake of fire. Verse 10 of, of chapter 20, you don't have to pull it up, but verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. He's done. He's gone. That's it. 
There is no more Satan. There is no coming back from this. There is no more, well, we're going to give him one more chance or we're going to give him one more time to kind of do his thing. None of that's going to happen. Once that takes place, that last battle, and once he finally proclaims that Jesus Christ is Lord, and he has to say it because that's what the Word of God says, and God is not a liar, so he has to say it. Once that takes place, then he will be cast into the lake of fire where he will be tormented day and night forever and ever after that is when the great white throne judgment will take place because you notice what it said in verse 10 it says where the beast and the false prophet are it doesn't say and all those that were not uh saved and all those that you know that were in hell they've just kind of been transferred over to this other holding facility it wasn't that it says where the false prophet and the beast are the antichrist and the false prophet and then satan is going to be thrown in and then we're going to have the great white throne judgment and every person that ever denied christ every person that ever rejected to accept christ rejected christ uh, in their life is going to have to stand before god and then they will be cast into the lake of fire once that is done it's done once the last person that rejected christ is separated from him from all eternity and is cast into the lake of fire it's over and we begin to just enjoy eternity we begin to there, there's no more scripture to be fulfilled there's no more prophecy to be fulfilled there's no more anything else that has to be done we just are with god forever and ever so um the millennial period itself there's not a whole lot of talk about it other than just the fact that it's a thousand years. Uh, we, we do know that people will still have to receive Christ. There are some, uh, the, there's a scripture in Isaiah, and I, I, I forgive me for not pulling it up. I wasn't planning on talking about that. But uh, there's a scripture in Isaiah that there are some people that will take that scripture, and they have uh, based a, theo- a theory on it, I guess I should say. They've based a theory on it that, you will have an opportunity to receive Christ up until the age of about 30. And then if you are born in the millennial period and you refuse to receive Christ after the age of 30, that you then will die. Now, I don't know about that. I have no idea. I've I've read the scripture before, and it seemed like it was kind of reaching for it, and that's another reason why I didn't bring it up. But I did just kind of want to throw that theory out that there are people that believe that. What we do know is this. The people that are born on earth during the millennial reign, they're going to have a lifespan, just like all the rest of us. They're going to have a lifespan, and they're either going to accept Jesus Christ and then either live the rest of that lifespan and then just instantly be regenerated into their glorified body or I don't know if it's a case of where uh, Christ once they receive him that he's just going to transform them then I really don't know I'm already going to be transformed so I ain't sweating it so uh, but there's a lot of theory uh, different theories that float around about the millennial reign and basically what I tell you about all of them is this take them all with a grain of salt Because if it's not in Scripture, we have no idea. We know Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. It says so in Scripture. We know that he's going to be loosed after that thousand years. It says so in the Word. We know that he's going to gather an army that's going to number as the sands of the sea. And right when they're getting ready to come against the saints, God is going to send fire from heaven and is going to devour them. We know that because the Word says it. Anything else that you hear... Take it with a grain of salt. And, and just, if you can't prove it by Scripture, it can't be proven. Okay? All right. Um, I'm trying to think, was there anything else I was wanting to... Well, let me just ask you this. Now that I'm coming to the end of this, and, I mean, we've been through a, a ride. I mean, between the, if you're watching this video and, and doing this, you know, we, I, I've covered just about, just about everything I can think of to cover as far as end times. However, if you have a question about any of it, even at the very beginning, if there's a question about any of it, please feel free to share that uh, now. Is there anybody you have a question? Yes. Oh, Okay. 
because we're live and so they can't hear you. I didn't know we were live. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask, since it is a judgment, then that would assume there's rewards and punishments of de varying degrees, correct or wrong? Um, the rewards, yes. The punishments, uh, I, I'm not one of those that ascribe to the idea that there are different levels of hell or that there are different levels of eternal punishment. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you just... Uh, saying, why else would there be uh, judgment if there are all these demons and if they're, if they're at the white throne of judgment, they're already considered lost, correct? Right. So why is there a judgment if there's no level? Okay, that is a good question. It's because of what I was talking about at the very beginning. You grab a microphone and bring it back to Glenda. Um, it's because of what I had mentioned at the very beginning that God is a righteous judge. And so if somebody, take for example, I believe that there are going to be church people that when they die, everybody at their funerals is going to be saying, oh, what a great person they were. And, oh, you know that they're in a better place and they're in heaven and all this kind of thing. But what they don't know is that deep down inside, they actually never were born again. They actually never gave themselves to Christ. They were church members, but they weren't Christians, okay? When that person dies and is not escorted into the presence of God, they're going to be confused, right? I mean, I would be. If it were a case where I spent my whole life in church, and even though I knew that I did my own thing, and, you know, I didn't pray, and I didn't actually ever give my life to Christ, I never asked Him to be my Savior, and I was never really born again, I was just active at church. That's not what Jesus said for getting to heaven. Jesus never said, except a man bake a, a macaroni and cheese for every single church dinner he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven he said we've got to be born again so there's going to be people that are going to to want to argue that they actually should be in heaven in fact scripture says jesus said that there will be those who will say lord did i not cast out devils in your name did i not do this did i not do that and yet he's going to say depart from me you worker of iniquity i never knew you so the great white throne judgment even though they already at death or at the rapture, or whatever it was, uh, that they were already deemed to be lost. The great white throne judgment, because he is a righteous judge, is to give them an opportunity to, for lack of better terms, plead their case. However, he will then show them that, okay, you thought that this was okay, but you forgot about this, or you didn't do this, or you never gave yourself to me you never received my son as your savior or you just you know as well as I do that you were just playing the game and so it's going to give them that opportunity to stand before God and like I said for lack of a better term plead their case however I don't I don't ascribe to the idea of okay we got somebody who was a church member but they never really got saved but they were in church since they were a kid they just assumed they were saved and all this kind of thing okay you're going to go to the part of hell or the part of the lake of fire where it's just really, it's, it's a dry heat. You know, I don't think it's going to be like that where, okay, you're not, we're not going to torment you with worms and, you know, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. You know, we're just going to make you have to listen to really bad music. Um, I, don't, I don't personally ascribe to that theology because of the fact that in Revelation 21, uh, uh, where Jesus is talking, or where uh, it's talking about, like, and the fearful and the unbelieving, et cetera, et cetera, uh, shall have their place in the lake of fire. And, but it also says that, and whosoever's name was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So that's, I mean, that's my opinion on that. Do you have uh, something you'd like to share about that? Or, okay, okay. And I mean, because if you feel I'm wrong, please just you know, respectfully, uh, please let me know and let's talk about this because this, you know, this discussion, this is what it's about. Ms. Glenda, you had your hand up. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, it's not a topic that you've actually discussed during this uh, series, but it is related to it in that I would like some clarification on the uh, ten virgins, the five wise and five foolish, if you can elaborate on that a little bit. All right. There were, we're talking about uh, the parable that Jesus told where there were the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Next question. 
No, uh, no. Well, what exactly? I mean, when you say, "Can I elaborate on it?" I mean, what what are we? I need clarification. Uh, I've always been confused about the fact that it's ten virgins. So obviously, um, uh, that means that they were all uh, Christians, I guess. Um, that it's purity. Why were there five that were left behind? Okay, I see what you mean. Um, because of the fact that they were virgins, uh, they were, uh, f for lack of better terms, they were candidates to be part of the bride, okay? To be part of uh, the, uh, to belong to the, the, the bridegroom, okay? What this parable is talking about, though, is kind of similar to what I was uh, just mentioning with the the great white throne and some of the situations that we're going to have. We're going to have people that are going to be church people, okay? Think of the virgins as church people. Now, there were those that prepared themselves. There were those that took the coming of the groom seriously. There were those that knew that he was going to come again and that he was coming for a bride who was ready for him. There are, going to be, there are going to be those that were trimming their lamps even though they didn't know when he was going to show up. There are going to be those who were sewing their garments even though they didn't know when, what time he was going to call for their names. The other five, the foolish ones, were the ones that were thinking, well, but he hasn't come back yet, so I've got time. He hasn't, he hasn't um, I haven't heard uh, that any rumors that, oh, oh, it's going to be today or it's going to be this week or anything like that, so I've got time to do this. They weren't tarrying, as I heard somebody talking about just the other day, they weren't tarrying until he came. They were sloughing off. They were just kind of doing their own thing. And we've got people that are going to be in the church that are thinking that they're okay because they're in a church. They're thinking they're going to be okay because their name is on a membership roll someplace. But the problem is they've done nothing to fill their lamps. They've done nothing to prepare for the bridegroom to come. They've done nothing to get themselves to a place to where they have have prepared themselves to be received by the bridegroom. So in this parable, as we're talking about this, and of course, what happened? The five foolish went and said, oh, you, you need to give us some of your oil. You know, you need, you, once again, they were looking at somebody else to do what they were supposed to be doing the entire time. And we've got people in the church that are going to be, in fact, we've got probably whole churches, whole denominations that are are going to be looking to blame everybody else because, well, yeah, I didn't have time to do that because I was too busy doing this over here. Or I didn't have time to, to study the Word because that's why we pay a preacher. And so he can tell us what the Bible says. Or, you know, I don't need to worry about praying. That's why we have people, in, you know, uh, we, we've got those little old ladies that will get in their prayer closet. Or we've got that guy that's so loud he prays all the time. We'll let him pray. I don't need to worry about that. And we've got whole organizations that are being built up like that and people like that because when you're not in that place of preparation you're in a place of playing you're in a place where you can just kind of do whatever you want and you know my, my granddaddy was a preacher so my tickets punched I'm sorry friend but it's to work out your own salvation we are personally responsible to have a personal relationship with our personal Savior. So the five foolish represent, in, in my opinion, such as it's worth, the five foolish virgins represent those that know. We're not talking about those that have never heard about Jesus. We're not talking about those that have never darkened the doors of a church. We're not talking about those that probably the only time they'll ever be in a church is if they're delivering a package or if it's a funeral and their mama said that, well, we're going to have it in a church. We're talking about those that know that Jesus is Lord, but they don't live that Jesus is Lord. So the, the foolish ones, they weren't looking for him. They weren't anticipating his arrival. And they weren't prepared. And so then, when the bridegroom came, they were off at the last moment trying to, trying to get their lamps filled, trying to get everything all together. And the problem is they were supposed to be preparing the whole time. So that now when they came back, and they said, oh, okay, we're ready, we're ready now, and it's too late. It's too late because the bridegroom was coming for a bride that was looking for them. 
does does that help you look like you're still confused does that help at all or do you have more questions no that does help yes. okay okay like I said, you were looking confused, so I thought, okay, I've just made it even worse on her. Now she's going to be like, wait a minute, how many were there? <laughs> Anybody else, you have a question or a comment, anything that you'd like to, to mention? I know Ryan had his hand up. I'm kidding, Ryan. I didn't, I didn't see your hand up. Ryan's like, I'm too tired to have a question. All right. Um, I do encourage you uh, to take what I've talked to you about throughout this series and, and the one prior, uh, take a look at Scripture. And if there's anything I've said that isn't lining up with Scripture, and it really this goes for anything, anytime I ever preach, anytime I ever teach, because my thing is this. I know that my knowledge of the Word of God only goes so far. And I know that I'm human and that I may make a mistake or I may misinterpret something. I've done it before. When I was a young pastor, uh, in fact, when I was a young youth pastor and I was just preaching at my church, as a senior pastor would give me the opportunity, there were things that I preached 30 years ago that I realize now that I, I had the wrong idea because I looked it up for myself in Scripture, and I've corrected that. I am really good at saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I'm awesome at that because I've done it so much and I've gotten so much practice for it uh so if if there's ever anything that I I say that you're like I don't think he's on the right on the right page with that one let's talk about it and I promise you that if I ever say anything from this podium or that pulpit or in the altars or anything like that and it is incorrect and it is inconsistent with the word of God I promise you just as publicly as I said it I will just as publicly apologize and correct it because I don't want to stand before God and him go, what were you thinking? So, <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for your, your questions and, and your discussion. Um, if all minds are clear, all right, that was your last chance. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Don't forget we do not have service next Wednesday, uh, but we do have a dinner tomorrow, and we're excited about that because we love dinner. So uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Because we know that as we have received you as our Savior, God, that there is a place in heaven that is ready for us. Jesus, you said yourself that you go to prepare a place for us. And if you go to prepare, prepare.